everybody, I'm Janie Goddard, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you once again to Dr. Frank Sabatino. Uh, Frank, please say hello. Hello, everybody. It's good to see you again or hear you again. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, what we're talking about today is something really interesting. And um, so uh, I just wanted to, um, Frank and I were speaking and what we were chatting about was that so many people say to us, um, you know, because of course we espouse the idea of a living a whole food plant based eating style and uh, really integrating that into your life. Um, ideally SOS free, which means a diet that is free of added refined salt, oil and sugar. Lots of people say, um, but isn't that really difficult to do? Um, or aren't I too old to do that? Is it going to do me any good to do that at this stage of life? A lot of people will actually say to me something like, uh, well, actually, I'm really trying to lose weight, Janie. So, you know, when you eat all those uh, fruits and potato and, new and sweet potatoes and so on, doesn't that gain weight as well? And so, you know, Frank and I talk about this sort of thing all the time. Um, so we want to share some of this wisdom with you. And uh, also, I think Frank needs to tell you about a course that he has as well um, which is just something that I wanted to bring up and he, he wasn't going to mention it but I wanted to bring it up to you because uh, it's really applicable to people in the latter category that I just mentioned so anyway Frank can I can I pass it over to you and play devil's advocate at this point and say um, many of many of the people I'm in contact with are saying I think it's too late for me to transition to being plant-based or even vegan. What, what's your response to that? Oh, I, that's, you know, that's such a huge, huge, huge mistake in, in the following way. Look, I, I've been involved in living this way over 40 years personally, but I've also had the unique opportunity of being able to counsel people as a physician, as a plant-based physician for most of those years also. And so I deal with people at every age and every demographic, you know. So look, if you have the unique advantage, like my children did, of growing up that way, that's phenomenal. But none of us did. I grew up in an Italian household in the Bronx back many moons ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, after a recent visit to New York, they still roam the, the Bronx, actually, where I'm from. But the bottom line is, um, I didn't have that advantage, and many of the, our listeners don't, you know. You know, we do a lot of these talks where we're kind of speaking to the choir, so I'm happy today that we're trying to bring people into the choir, because this is such an important piece. So I have people that come in with health issues in their 60s and 70s and 80s, and it's remarkable to me how making even small changes in a plant-based direction, even in those very advanced ages, dramatically improves quality of life and even reverses pathological conditions that have been etched over a long period of time. I think it's important for people to realize that when you look at most of the Western nations of the world, the conditions and problems that demand the most healthcare dollars really haven't changed over many years. There are heart disease, obesity, stroke, high blood pressure, cancer, diabetes. And the intriguing piece about these chronic, basic chronic diseases is not only are they prevented by this kind of beautiful plant-based approach, but the remarkable thing is that they are absolutely reversed. And so this is a very important piece because that reversal can happen at just about any age. Now, the truth is the earlier you start, the better. But my opinion is, in answering your question, it is never, never too late because I have seen recoveries in people that I never thought would be able to respond and recover. I've seen people that were told by their doctors they had only months to live, and then those people bury those very doctors that told them they were gonna die in some short period of time because they made these changes. So if there's one thing I can hammer home is that when we look at the remarkable pathology in the world, in the Western world, chronic diseases, and the incredible money that is spent by governments and people to handle these things, probably 75% plus of all that money is being devoted to conditions that can be changed by simple lifestyle modification. And the fundamental one is eating in, with less animal-based foods and more plant-based material. I completely agree. And in fact, actually that chimes 
beautifully with my experience because of course as you know but I don't know how many of our viewers actually know that uh, I have the autoimmune condition rheumatoid arthritis and what actually happened for me was that I was desperately desperately ill um, I'd actually been a full-time wheelchair user I'm not going to go into the whole gory story at the moment uh, because we've got other things that we need to talk about but the thing that made the difference for me and got me out of that wheelchair was moving to a completely plant-based diet a whole food plant based diet at that time I was doing a high well a completely raw uh, vegan diet and I've transitioned now to having mostly raw 99 95 99% raw with a small amount of uh, cooked food just for variety and to get extra nutrients that you can get from certain cooked foods now well, let, me make, let me make one comment because I don't talk about this a lot mm. but in light of that I you know my only early history I spent most of my childhood dealing with the profound situation of colitis and even ulcerative colitis into my early teenage years. And interestingly enough, on that background, I grew up in an Italian household where meat and dairy and so on were mainstays of the diet. And it wasn't until I got exposed to the plant-based approach in my later teenage years going into college that I was able to completely resolve that situation of colitis that had really plagued me most of my childhood. So I want people to understand that I'm not coming from some cotton ball. This is really based on me recovering even in my own life over a long period of time, long before I was a physician. Yeah. Do you know, it's interesting, Frank, I think the thing is that at the, a lot of people will look at you, they'll look at me and they'll think, gosh, you know, they look really healthy, they look really well, they've never had a day's illness in their lives. And I think it's actually quite reassuring for people to know that we do know whereof we speak, you know, so I think that's actually quite a useful thing. Um, you know, we've both actually faced some really devastating stuff. So we, we know how bad and how bad it can get when people are really ill, but we also see the flip side and we live the flip side don't we which is you know completely committing to eating plants and, and of course we we have other reasons for doing so because we're both animal lovers and so of course the, the vegan side of things and the animal well, you know, that, that's an important point i mean well. people people get into this diet or this way of eating and our and our audience probably will resonate with this usually for one of three reasons usually health reasons or it could be for animal rights or animal concerns and compassion or environmental concerns. Those of us that have been doing it a long time, we embrace all three of those love affairs pretty much. But I don't really care at this point how people get involved, what drives them to get in. I truly want to bring them into the fold because the truth of the matter is, I really believe that this is a direction and a choice that is going to improve personal health and truly save the planet if we're going to be able to really do that. And again, in light of the elephant that's in the room now with COVID-19 and viral that infection, we know that a foundation for that transmission of viruses from animal to man centers around animal food production with factory farms. It centers around markets wet with the you know, feces and urine and blood of animals that are snacked and killed and slaughtered. And so we know that all of that feeds this and intriguingly, we also know that the people that have the greatest mortality dying in this current epidemic are people that have morbid and comorbid conditions of high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, and the like. And the beautiful thing is, not only does the plant-based approach eliminate the cause of animal transmission, but it actually resolves those morbid conditions that will reduce mortality even if you are in fact infected. So the benefit is so pervasive across the board by making these very simple nutritional changes. Mm, absolutely. Tell you what, Frank, can you pull your screen forward a little bit? Because um, I don't know quite why. If you're like that? Yeah, that's great. We can see you now. Yes. You're, I think your, uh, your screen kind of falls backwards a bit. <laughs> so, okay. Am I better now? Are we good? It's fantastic. Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Really yeah, cool. wonderful. Um, so actually, as you were just speaking there, I was just thinking it, it, it's put me in mind of something. And uh, you know how we often talk about um, epigenetics, and I was wondering if it might actually be worth at this point bringing in the, some of the epigenetic picture about the way that the choices that we make on a day-to-day -day basis 
actually influence our future health. And that's right across the board from everybody from the very, very young to the elderly. So, uh, and there is that epigenetic component and possibly even chat about that uh, research uh, done in men who have prostate cancer. Yeah, uh, you know, it's intriguing. I think all of us have been brought up with this concept of you know genetic predisposition I mean, and you see it and you know and you see it when you're counseling people in practice they come in and they'll say well my father had high blood pressure my grandfather so i'm going to have high blood pressure what does it matter what i do or someone says that about diabetes or heart disease and so they feel confined and really shackled to the deck of genetic cards that they were basically dealt from their parents what was intriguing is, is that uh, from actually many, many years ago, uh, the first observation of how lifestyle factors or conditions outside the genetic machinery could impact the expression of genes in any one individual was a profound observation, and we see that now. So even though the genes themselves may be hardwired, we know that what part of that genetic environment is expressed can be remarkably affected by how we eat and how we move and the stress that we are involved in and so on. And, and that's kind of intriguing. I, I, you know, in the human body, you have genes that will promote cancer, which scientists like to call oncogenes. There are things that actually have the, the predisposition to express cancer activity. And then you have what are called suppressor genes, genes that will suppress the expression of cancer or suppress genes that express cancer. So those population of genes live side by side in that remarkable helix that's involved in the chromosomes that are containing all of our genetic material. Um, classic example, a number of years ago, Dean Ornish and his group uh, did a great study on prostate cancer. And I love this study because they took men that had prostate cancers that had not been operated or treated, and they analyzed the genetics of the prostate cancer cells. Then they put them on a 12-week program, about 12 weeks, of eating plant-based, doing about a 30-minute walk five times a week. They were involved in yoga a few times a week and even a little bit of psychological counseling for the stress component. And following that protocol, what they discovered was that that lifestyle approach turned off over 450 genes that were involved in the expression of cancer. PSA levels dropped cancer and that change stayed for a long period of time a year or more depending on how well people adhere to that mm -hmm. we now know for example that women who are involved in a good solid 150 minutes of good solid aerobic like activity could have as much as a 60 percent reduction in the expression of genes that are involved in breast cancer outcome we well, know for just to stop you there so 150 minutes is that per week? That's like 30 minutes, five times a week, and even less had an impact, but that, in that amount has a huge impact of really dramatically, and what it did is it literally turned off. The, understand, the people need to understand this. This exercise literally turned off genes that express cancer. What a remarkable situation, and we know that even 12 minutes a day of, of a meditative stress, you know, modifying activity on a daily basis will modify the aging process of, of, of chromosomes. We know the impact on telomeres, which I know you've talked about many times yourself, but also turning off genes again that express cancer. So understand that we all have this genetic machinery that may predispose us to express one condition or another, but never lose sight of the fact of how powerful the impact is of what you're doing to change the expression of those genes. And we know that in, an, in another study with plant-based, there are enzymes, proteins that the body produces that actually repair our DNA. The body has its own wisdom, it's evolved these proteins that can help it repair itself. So they did a study looking at people that smoked, and we know that smoking damages DNA. And so unless you have some repair enzyme, the chance for DNA damage and maybe even the expression of cancer from nicotine and all the chemicals in cigarettes may be profound. What they discovered is that people that were on the combination of a variety of plant-based foods, berries, fruits, greens, things of that nature, had a remarkable increase, almost 25 times 
the expression and production of repair enzymes at a genetic level compared to people who did not eat those foods. So, you know, we have a lot of evidence now to suggest that, wow, the things we do routinely at any age can have a profound effect at modifying even our genetic expression. And it looks like the basic lifestyle factors that we've always touted, plant-based nutrition, consistent physical activity, stress-modifying behavior, have the greatest impact on that genetic benefit. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful, isn't it? And what I think the, the other point that we really need to drive home for everybody is that the results um, from eating a plant-based, a whole food plant-based diet are apparent so fast. It's not as if, you know, it's one of these things that you have to do for months and months and months and months and months on end before you notice any difference. I find with my clients uh, that if, you know, if, if they're doing what I say and they're eating, or if I have the luxury of taking them away on a retreat, um, and so I've got them as sort of a captive audience, or I know, for example, for you in your centers that you've run over many, many years, the change and how, how they feel and their wellness levels they change within they notice a change within a couple of days uh day we, we, three, we'll see we'll see blood sugar levels drop 100 to 200 points in a week yeah well, we'll I've, seen it. I've seen it with your patients um yeah, we'll, we'll see that in a week we'll yeah. see people lose one to two pounds a day yes. across the seven day period right out of the blocks we'll see people coming in with profound levels of inflammation all of a sudden the pain is less, the mobility is better. And interestingly enough, the joint architecture may not change. There may be damage that's over many years, but it's intriguing how the mobility and the inflammation and all of that can change in a matter of days. And that's why I tell people it's never too late to start. You want to get on that bandwagon as quickly as you can. Absolutely. So in that case, let's tell everybody how they can do that. Um, okay. We've got to keep everybody uh, watching for ages because we've all got lots and lots of online things to do whilst we're in lockdown. Yes, so, yes. <laughs> so let's crack on then and talk about what you would suggest uh, the first steps are for people who want to embrace a whole food. Well, let's, let's, hit, let's hit the big four right out of the blocks, meaning uh, number one, we know that we want to transition from eating animal protein in the form of flesh. We need to get away from it. We know that animal protein creates a whole series of things. It increases saturated fat intake that will modify insulin function, increasing the risk of diabetes. We know it will prom promote a whole series of things like nitrosamines, chemicals that promote inflammation. We know that animal protein in the form of flesh proteins, meat, fish, red meat, will urge the bacteria in the body to produce something called TMAO, trimethylamine oxide that increases the risk of heart disease. So we know that it promotes a series of inflammatory agents, chemicals that compromise the body long-term, increasing the risk of everything from you know, uh, brain disease, heart disease, cancer, and the like. We know that when that saturated fat goes up, it will cause, and this is even in the form of oils themselves, even bottled oils, even what we consider healthy oils, coconut oil, olive oil, they will cause a stiffening of arteries that do not respond to the nitrous oxide of the body, which tends to dilate vessels and allow blood and blood pressure to subside. So we get blood pressure elevations, we see that. So, you know, the bottom line is we want to get away from the meat products. We want to understand that fat is an essential macronutrient of the body, but it must come in in whole food forms, not in isolated bottled oils. I mean, there's no animal in nature that isolates the pure fat from their food chain, puts it in big bottles of liquid fat, and then pours it on everything. Mm -hmm. Classic example, you know, in the vegan field for many years, everybody touted coconut oil. Coconut oil has 85% saturated fat. It'll raise cholesterol levels and heart disease risk, as well as a steak will. So, you know, you got to look at bottled oil. So we recommend, second piece, eating oil only in the foods in which it exists. So we want avocados and nuts and greens. People don't realize how much oils are in basic deep greens, kale, mustard greens, all of that. And they even provide the beautiful omega-3 fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory. So we want to reduce the animal protein. We want to reduce the fat and then only have it in whole food form. And then, of course, we want to get rid of any of the refined foods, the high sugary refined foods, because these things will promote 
remarkable abnormal weight gain, remarkable inflammation, again, increasing the risk of heart disease. And um, the bottom line is these sugars also will tend to feed uh, cancer growth. They will tend to feed cells that are, you know, promoting cancer within the body. So, you know, the big three are reducing animal protein in the form of um, flesh foods, getting, and that also includes, by the way, m milk and dairy products. You know, it, that's an old standby. You know, all the milk of any animal that's grown is really growth liquid for that animal. So the mother, the milk that human mother's milk is geared for the growth rate of a human infant, while cow's milk is geared for the growth rate of a human, of a baby cow. Cows grow to full maturity in three years. We grow across 15 to 20 years. So when you're pumping these foods into a human body that's fostering abnormal growth, it's no mystery why we have girls menstruating earlier, boys getting bigger, faster, increasing the risk of breast cancer, prostate cancer, those milk products have no place in the human body. They also produce a high level of a growth factor called insulin-like growth factor, which also triggers cancer growth, and especially in men, prostate cancer growth. So we want to get rid of animal flesh. We want to get rid of the dairy products that are derived from animal bodies. We want to get rid of fractured and bottled oils using fatty foods that contain those, but healthy forms of fat and we wanna get rid of the refined sugar. So to me, those four things are pillars of what has to change and transition almost immediately. Now, coupled with that then, is the understanding that nobody likes deprivation. In all the years of counseling people, I've yet to find anybody who truly loves deprivation. In fact, if I tell somebody not to do something, there's a part of their brain that can't wait to do it and can't wait to do it in my face. So what's interesting is, is that when you are a newbie and just coming into this, everything I've just said may seem unbelievably daunting. I like my steak, I like my milk, I like my cheese on my pizza. So this is the place where what we call substitutions or analog foods may actually help that person in transition. So get the non-dairy milks. Get milk that's made from almonds or cashews or whatever, coconut milk. Get a dairy product or a cheese, the Miyoko, or some form of cheese made from plant sources. Get a burger or some form of those kind of meat substitutions. They tend to have higher salt. They tend to have higher oil. Are they ideal? They're not, but they also allow you to not have that feeling of deprivation. Over time, most people need those foods less and less, but they, I think all of us that have kind of transitioned into this way of eating, we've done that with a little bit of patience and a little bit of use of some of those substitution foods. So I'm urging people to understand that you don't wanna have that sense of deprivation. Start replacing those big four things I talked about, those animal products, the dairy, all of that, the refined sugar, with plant sources and maybe even transition foods to some degree that will help you do that. But the other side of this coin too is understand that tastes are gonna change because everything that we do now has been conditioned by choices that we've all made over a very long period of time. But as you start sampling new things, as your body starts cleansing and detoxifying and changing and healing, your taste buds even change. Those things that you didn't think were gonna have any taste now become unbelievably wonderful. I mean, think about it. You know, people knock fruit. A lot of people knock fruit, it's a huge mistake because fruit is really the only food that we pick and eat without any thought to how we're gonna prepare it. Nobody picks a mango and says, how am I gonna saute this mango? How am I gonna bake this mango? So in its natural state, fruit is our natural sweet. And as it turns out, the color of fruits and vegetables have a lot of the antioxidants and supportive chemicals. So I always tell people, you want to put a rainbow on your plate. So start introducing more of that fresh fruit. And if you can make fruit your sweet, and you can start adding the complex carbohydrates with high fiber that will fill you up, potatoes and whole grains and things of that nature, quinoa, wild rice, things of that nature, you're going to have a sense of satiety. So you won't be craving, you won't be feeling empty, you'll be feeling satisfied, and you'll be doing it in a way now that will really support 
the quality of your life and health. But it's got to be a smooth transition. And if you need some substitution, that's what you do. Yeah. Okay. One of the things I do with, with uh, my patients is that uh, I do what I call a crowding out kind of approach. And so what I mean by that is um, you, uh, they will start by, I will give them smoothies, for example, because, uh, and, and my smoothies are what I call stealth nutrition smoothies. So for example, I'll make a delicious fruit smoothie, but I'll chuck a big handful of kale or spinach or broccoli or what have you, some really good potent greens because when you whiz those up in a high speed blender what happens is that they are broken down to such an extent that you cannot no matter how much of a, a foodie you are and how how sensitive your taste buds are you cannot detect the taste of those greens most people don't believe it but it's absolutely true so what you're doing there is you're creating a nutrition bomb and a lot of the reason that people tend to crave certain foods and so on is because they are lacking in really essential vitamins and minerals. And so they'll be overeating in an effort and eating literally anything they can get their hands on in an effort to try to, to fill those, those nutritional gaps. So what I tend to find works incredibly well is where I give people things like smoothies, which are very filling, which will give them this massive nutrition bomb. And um, in fact, I've got smoothie recipes on my website. So if people are interested, they can go there. And I know you've got brilliant, uh, brilliant data about what people can do if they're going out to eat and so on. But I find doing that, that, that particular approach um, is really helpful because what it means is that when you've got people filled up and not craving for other things because because their nutritional needs are being met, they tend then not to go out and feel that they need to have a bacon uh, sandwich or uh, you know some sausages and on toast or something like that. Very British or fish and chips, very British meals, um, or a big curry. Um, and so that seems to me to work very very well. And so I tend to suggest that that's a good way forward if people are starting to transition is to add smoothies in, uh, not be afraid of fruit. As you've quite rightly said, there's a lot of nonsense um, that's out there floating around the internet about fruit and about how dreadfully fattening it is and so on, because people are forgetting, yes, of course it does contain fructose, but people are forgetting that fruits have a constellation of cofactors that are so unbelievably healthy. These phytochemicals and phytonutrients in fruit are amazingly good for us. Um, and in fact, they boost the activity of, of other cofactors like vitamin C, for example. So we get uh, the response in the body of when you eat a piece of fruit, it may not actually have that much measurable vitamin C, but it has massive bang for its buck insofar as vitamin C like activity is concerned when it gets inside us. So there are lots of little tricks that we can do. Um, the other thing I wanted to just get your take on Frank is uh, the use of beans and um, other um, other things that people can actually use for protein because the other thing that people really worry about is and it's always the same question but where am I going to get my protein and so of course you know our normal response is well where does a gorilla get his protein or where does a rhino get his or where does an elephant get his protein the biggest animals on the planet are plant-based so okay. how do you respond when people say where do I get my protein Okay, let, let, let's, let's, let me step back a ways too, because you brought up an, a big point about satiety and satisfaction in people's lives too, and I'll tie it all together. It's very important to realize that we are absolutely recommending a diet plan, this eating plan, this plant-based plan, because it is so high in fiber and water. And we're recommending in transition that people maintain high fibery, watery foods because there will be a filling up effect. But these foods also have what we call the lowest calorie density. So if you look at the calories that a food contains by weight, let's say calories per pound, you'll notice fruits and fruits and green leafy vegetables are one to 400 calories a pound. That means you could eat room, a room full of vegetation and not have any problem with weight gain. And yet those foods, because they're so high in fiber and water, will give you a filling up effect. So the next level of that are things like whole grains, like wild rice, quinoa, and all of the potatoes. 
People have always shied away. They vilified potatoes for so many years, and you know it and I know it. They were told about this glycemic index and it's going to raise this sugar level of their body and promote weight gain. One of the best weight loss foods on planet Earth are potatoes. And the important thing to realize is that potatoes and whole grains, once again, are only about 400 to 700 calories a pound. So by the time you look at the volume of those foods for the calories they're giving, if you were just eating fruit, potatoes, whole grains, and greens, you would be eating a diet that's basically 600 calories or less per pound. So think about that. You could eat pounds. You could eat three to five pounds of food a day, which is substantial, and still be under 2,000 calories a day. And so the whole point there is, is that when you're eating those foods, it builds in calorie protection. And I want people to realize that your best opportunity for losing weight, and that's why when we take away the addictive quality of food, all the heavy salt, oil, and sugar, that's also what's programming overeating in addition to the nutrient deficiencies that you talked about. But here's the other beautiful thing, that while those foods have such low calorie density, they have the greatest nutrient density, as you mentioned. So their micronutrients, all of the vitamins, minerals, and even the macronutrients that the foods have, they have the greatest amount of nutrient density for low calorie density. So you're getting filled up with the best quality food at the lowest calorie amount. So you're building in this incredible weight protection while having satisfaction, satiety, and incredible abundant health. Now tied into that in macronutrients, yes, people have been brought up. I was brought up. I grew up at a time when you played sports, you had steak and eggs for breakfast. That was the training program for people when I grew up, steak and eggs. And people still, and that's why this recent movie, Game Changers, that shows these athletes now totally debunking that way of eating. You know, they've done studies on the, they did the architect, the uh, anthropological studies of the gladiators of ancient Rome. And what they discovered was, you know, we have this image of these guys going into the arena and battling to the death, eating slabs of meat in their training. Yeah. What they discovered is that their training meals were beans and barley. That's right. So when you look at the whole grains and you look at the legumes that you brought up, they are remarkably abundant in high quality protein. Now I, you know, I, I maintain a six, two frame, 185 pound body with about 10 to 12% body fat at almost 70 years of age. And I've been doing this 40 years. I certainly don't look like I'm going to fade away. Haven't had a drop of animal protein in all of those years. We've been, we've been given this, um, this really asinine approach to think that the only way you can intake protein is in animal bodies, eating animal bodies, and eating them in large amounts. It's a huge, huge mistake. When you're eating the plant-based protein, and as you point out, the largest land mammals on this planet are all plant eaters. So the bottom line is we need to eat an abundance of greens, whole grains, legumes like lentils, all the variety of beans, chickpeas, and the like. But here's a transition thing. If you have not been eating that high fiber and you go into eating huge amounts of those foods, it will be very uncomfortable. And so I always tell people to recommend eating a few ounces of those foods in a very cooked form, pressure cooked, especially with beans, with greens, steamed or whatever, with a little lemon on those. And that combination of greens and legumes in small amounts is a nice way to transition. The other thing that's important is for people to realize that a large part of the gas and bloating that they experience after eating is from swallowed air. Mm. It's an evidence of about 80% of all the bloat, the gas that we have is actually swallowed air. So I tell people you need to eat slowly, chew your food almost to a cream in your mouth, and I'm a culprit because I'm a fast eater, and I gotta slow things down myself. And if you're having beans properly pressure cooked in an Instant Pot, or even if you buy canned beans and you use companies like Eden or, Errol, or any of those companies that actually pressure cook their organic beans, uh, and you're eating them slowly, chewing them thoroughly, eating them in small amounts to adjust, you'll find that you'll do very well. They can be put in soups. They can be blended into different forms. So there's different ways that they can come in. 
but I urge people to make that transition from the animal protein into those plant-based proteins. And that can also include a small amount of nuts, which I have a lot of fat, but they also do have a little bit of protein too. But greens, grains, legumes, but make the transition a little bit slowly over the course of several weeks. And you won't have the issues with lectins and the bloating and the gas that sometimes people will experience, but they need to slow the eating down, chew things very thoroughly. Okay, drink a little less at mealtime. If you need to drink anything, a small amount of water can be consumed, but no other liquids with mealtime. Uh, and that would be a good beginning transition, but it builds in this tremendous calorie protection. I love when people come to me and say, beans and potatoes are fattening. They're not fattening at all. This has been, this has been one of the uh, biggest con jobs that has been hoisted on the population. The leanest people on this planet and the most long-lived are all bean and potato eaters. Yes. Look at the Blue Zone women in Okinawa. All they eat are purple potatoes. Sixty percent of their diet is purple potatoes. If you look at of many cultures in Costa Rica, the Nicoya Peninsula, that Blue Zone, beans, grains and beans are a huge part. So the fiber content, and if you're eating more watery, fibery, nutrient-rich foods, you're going to find that you will not feel empty, even your bacteria will be satisfied. That's going to make you satisfied because there's a part of food that we can't digest, and that's fiber. But the bacteria that outnumber our cells, the organisms in our body that outnumber our cells 10 to 1, thrive on that fiber. And we now know that even the satisfaction of that bacteria feeds back through the gut and brain to create satiety for us as an organism. So think about all those connections that are being fed by that plant-based program and greater levels of happiness actually as well it's a very interesting uh, thing and i think we should hold that particular topic um gut microbiome and uh and the, the microbiota story for another day because yeah, it's that's a whole exciting. discussion in itself oh, it's a it's a huge we could go on I for agree. hours on that I agree. We'll, we'll rein it in um so for the viewers let's wrap this up now um because i do want to get in a couple of things uh one is that i just wanted to ask you about uh, when we're all released from lockdown, everybody's going to go out to eat. If people are looking to transition to a plant-based diet, um, what are the best bit? What, what's the best bet for them? Now, you've actually got a free book that you wrote. Um, yeah, on, on my website, drfranksabatino.com, I, I have a free gift that is a plant-based guide to eating out in the real world. Now, understand where this came from. Um, I personally advocate and live in a way where I'm not adding salt, oil, and sugar to my food. It's whole food, plant-based. And I want to emphasize, and I know the smoothies have a value because they do, but we're always emphasizing whole plant foods. as much in the whole food form, steamed, raw, any way you can get them in. And I think most of us are used to having things more cooked. So you can have a salad a day. At breakfast, I like to include a little bit of cereals like buckwheat or oatmeal with a little bit of fresh fruit because it's satisfying. It tends to stabilize people. Um, but if you're going to go out, understand that many of the ethnic cultures of the world, many of the long-lived blue zone cultures of the world, have been doing a plant-based, basically a plant-based approach for centuries. So I tell people, why reinvent the wheel? Sometimes if you're going out, you can go to Japanese or Thai or Chinese and get some really remarkable plant-based options. You can ask them to load, keep the oil and salt a little bit lower. They will respond. So what I did, instead of getting people eating just a lot of processed analog foods, substitution foods, which in transition you can do, I'd rather see them eat whole foods that have some of the seasoning of these ethnic groups. So the bottom line is my little guide takes you through Thai, uh, Chinese restaurant or takes you through Indian cuisine. And is it perfect? No, because they may have a little bit of salt and a little bit of oil here or there, but they're still using whole plant foods. They're using legumes and they're using greens and they're using grains. And so I find that that's a kind of an easier transition model. Work with some of the substitution foods that have the lowest amount of salt and oil that you can. And I think once you get into, and there are so many 
I know you have a great little SOS recipe thing that you've given away on your site. There are so many things on YouTube videos now with all the press preparation, uh, even groups like ForksOverKnives.com. They have recipes that people can follow so simply. So I would urge people to just get a little familiar with a few items. Learn how to do a quinoa dish. Learn how to do a bean dish. You know, learn how to uh, cook a good pasta dish. Make some steamed veggies. Get a little creative with some vegetable stir fries, very simply. And once you get a little bit familiar with a few items, remember this, most households in America only cycle, in America and probably in other countries too, only cycle through about six to eight dishes a month because they work in a family. So if you can even add a couple of new ideas, it's so already like a 25% upgrade. And then you're getting familiar and you're starting to see, well, gee, this thing of cooking beans with some grains and some veggies, it's not as difficult as I thought. And it's certainly a lot less expensive than I thought. And so once you see that financially it's in your best interest, it's not difficult to prepare. You make a few simple items, get some recipes when you want to get a little more festive at holiday time, have fun with it. And, and I think the transition then becomes a very natural kind of thing. And if you have children, they want a pizza. Give them a pizza. Get them a whole grain crust. Put a little soy or some form of coconut cashew cheese on it. Put all the veggies. That's what I did with my children. They never felt deprived. They always had something. If you need an ice cream, there are coconut milk ice creams that are a little high in fat and sugar, but they're an alternative. Or you can make it at home. Uh, you can make your own sorbet in a Vitamix. So there's a lot of little things like that that you can do that will keep you on a better track. And then right now we're coming into the season to be jolly. All the best fruit comes out now. Peaches, plums, cherries, nectarines, mangoes, papaya. Take advantage of that bounty of nature now. Get those fruits, get all those tastes, make fruit salads, put a few little nuts in it, put a little mint in it, put a, just play with it, be festive with it, have fun with it. And remember, the herbs and spices are a very important part of this, healthy herbs and healthy spices. So even though we're taking away salt and things of that, that nature, we're certainly not taking away basil and garlic and oregano and turmeric and ginger. And so use those incredible plants and herbs to heighten and, and, and kind of improve that, that attractiveness of those meals. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's why I created the plant-based guide. It's just another way for when you eat out to see that, okay, I can go into an ethnic restaurant and I'll try that. And that'll keep me on at least a vegan plant-based track. And that'll be a wonderful thing to do. I love how excited you get when you start talking about Well, I'm Italian too. I'm talking about food. You understand that, right? I know. It's like, it's, it's your The worst thing to do is have an Italian person talk about food because it's like, you know. <laughs> it's an obsession, isn't it? It's a crazy obsession. But that's beautiful. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and thank you also for mentioning the recipe book that's on my site. So oh, your you recipe know, book is so amazing. I want you to make sure people can get at it because it's yeah. really what, remarkable. What I'm going to do, Frank, is under, for, for all of our viewers, um, underneath this video, there's a little arrow at the side. You just need to click on that and then that will drop down and then you'll be able to, that we'll put live links. So you'll be able to get Frank's book and you'll also be able to get my uh, various eBooks and uh, my recipe book as well. And let them know people, and again, people that have had issues that are suffering with issues of weight or they know people that have complications of disease because of weight. I put this incredible program called Lean for Life together, which is a compassionate plant-based approach covering the best and easiest ways to really solve that weight issue. And not only that, it covers everything from the hormonal base, environmental toxicity and that impact, all of the components of addiction. What drives hunger? What, you know, what are we eating for? What are those things that are driving our abnormal appetites in different ways? So it covers all of that. So that's available to people. And that's also on the drfranksabatino.com website, right on the homepage. Well, I'll tell you what I, why I think that is so important is because it is very unusual to get any sort of nutritional or let's say weight loss advice. Uh, from somebody who actually has not one but two doctorates. Uh, so I think that is 
so so you know i know that we both come from this real need for evidence um so you know when we speak we like to know that we can actually always just go and point to the research um, and remember these come from the practical application in centers with thousands of people over the last 40 years so it's not just a didactic researched academic approach it has that it has the science yeah. but it's science that's been evidenced in actually the practical clinical outcome well I've, actually, I've actually met people i've actually met people who um have lost the weight because of your advice and care uh, they've lost dramatic amounts of weight and more importantly they've kept it off and they haven't yo-yoed they've made a lifestyle change uh, which is obviously what you're teaching and the weight just drops. It just drops off so quickly, but in a healthy way. Because let me make one other point for transition. Let me, let me make one other point for transition. And that is you need to be incredibly patient, kind, and loving with yourself. Understand that a number of the things that you may be choosing to do right now, for example, even dairy or sugar, they have their own addictive quality. So they've etched their way into the reward cascade of your own brain over a long period of time. So for example, we know that the major protein in dairy is something called casein. When you eat it in the body, there's a conversion into about eight different forms of morphine, casomorphines. So it has an opiate-like effect, an opioid-like effect. And when you're eating sugar, there's an addictive quality. There's a dopamine-like effect that's, exam that's enhanced. So the body's gonna have a little time factor for the recovery from those addictive substances. And you've got to be a little patient and understand that as you're making change, there may be some cravings that come up and down here or there. Don't beat yourself up. Make those substitutions, bring the foods in that we're recommending, and give your body time for recovery. Give your body the time to process through your own pattern of addiction. We've all dealt with it. We've all had it. I don't care how many years you've been doing this. You've dealt with it at some point. And I'm urging you just to be kind and patient and loving with yourself in this process of change. Perfect. Thank you so much. We'll leave it there. I think this has been an amazing chat and I think it will be so useful to so many people. So thank you, Frank. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody. Take care, everybody. Lots of love. Stay safe and well. Bye.